Thank you, sir. You guys can take out your Bibles and your bulletins. Or shall I say your cell phone and your bulletin that's actually a piece of paper. <laughs> I brought a little friend just to help me preach today. He doesn't like to talk very much, but he's going to just um, be here to uh, root, root us on. Actually, shall I say, to hoot us on. <laughs> I know I'm terrible at jokes, but at least I try. Owly, don't fall. This is, by the way, this is Owly. Not because my son's Ollie. Okay, so this is Owly. And uh, he's here to join us today for the message. And then he's going to stick around for the block party. We got any KSU owls out there today? Come on, say, whoo, whoo. Y'all aren't very good at that. <laughs> All right, KSU Owls and those that love the KSU Owls. Come on, let's say, whoo, whoo. <laughs> Pardon the strange message title today and, uh, you know, just honestly, the odd symbolism that I'm going to use uh, to preach the word of God today. But I've been asking, I asked the Lord for a special word for a special day. So the title of today's message is... Feed the owls. Feed the owls. So I invite you to follow along in your bulletin. And the reason I'm preaching this message specifically today is in honor of our biggest outreach of the year. For those of you that don't know, um, we are about to complete two years. We're about to have our two-year anniversary since we planted Encounter Church. Yeah? And a year ago, we said, how could we celebrate the one-year anniversary? Instead of doing something for us, you know, like a special conference or a party for us, we said the whole reason we moved to the Atlanta area to plant a church in the first place was to reach people, right? For people, to help people in this community to encounter God. So the best way to celebrate our anniversary as a church would be to do something for the people of our community, right? So we did Feed the Owls. Last year, Feed the Owls 2015. And some of you, uh, your first encounter with Encounter Church was Feed the Owls last year, right? And so we decided what better way to celebrate two years as a church than to do Feed the Owls again. So this is Feed the Owls 2. So one more time, come on, let's say, whoo. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about owls. I thought... And prayed through this for about three days before I could decide what in the world I wanted to say to Encounter Church on Feed the Owls Day. Okay? So let's just talk a little bit about owls. I studied about owls, right? Scientifically and biologically and biblically what owls mean. Kind of their symbolism, okay? So just a few things. I know that a lot of you know a lot of this stuff. Some of it might be new to you. But owls have big eyes and big ears, Owls have big eyes and big ears. I think we all knew about the eyes, but have you ever paid attention to the fact that owls also have big ears? And in some species of owls, you can see their big ears. In some species, you can't really see how big their ears are, but the, the ear itself, the inner ear, is very big and strong, okay? Another thing about owls um, is that they have a particularly strong grip. They can hold on really, really tight. You ever seen an owl perched up in a tree? Those are some big animals with their tiny little legs holding on tight, holding their whole body up on a limb, right? So they have big eyes, they have big ears, and they have a very, very strong uh, grip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you uh, uh, just a couple more things, and I'm going to read you a little excerpt from an article about owls, okay? Another thing about owls is that they are lonely and they are solitary most of the time, okay? They're kind of loners. Another thing is that they are known as, this is their nickname, they are the hunters of the night, okay? Like we have eagles and hawks and falcons that are the hunters of the daylight hours. Owls are the hunters of the night. They scavenge at night for their food. They hunt at night. So let me just read you this. You guys ready just to hear a little bit of scientific, biological information, a little bit more about owls? It's, it's quick, okay? A volume could be written on the eye of an owl. Perhaps its most wonderful feature being in the power of the bird 
to enlarge its iris if it wishes more distinct vision. Owls can control, they can like go from zoom in to zoom out vision like at will. <laughs> they have this incredible eye, okay? Um, we, could, we could read another whole article on the prominent and peculiar auditory parts. They can hear what pretty much no other animal can hear. They have an extreme keen sense of both vision and hearing, okay? So that's, that's owls. Um, with almost all owls, the feet are so arranged that the two toes can be turned forward and two backward, okay? They literally, they have four, so they literally can do this, two forward, and then I can't do it because I'm not an owl, but they can turn two of their toes around to the back to hold on really, really, really tight uh, to the branch. This reinforces their grip and gives it a, an extra toe, an unusual strength of foot. Huh. They are all night hunters, taking, prey, taking the prey to be found in the darkness. And um, the owl has, this is, this is really important. The owl was very numerous in all of history in caves, ruins, specifically ruined temples, okay, and in the ruins of old cities. It's given, the owl is given a special place in the Bible. And when I say special, I don't mean that in a positive sense. Because it was considered unfit for food. If you've ever read the Old Testament, you've read the word unclean, okay? Unfit for food. And because people dreaded their dreadful, scary, whoo, at night. People were terrified of owls, okay? They're creatures of darkness. Now, in the, in, in the world of philosophy, owls are considered a symbol of? wisdom right the bible doesn't paint such a positive picture of owls now we know that as creatures that god made there's absolutely nothing wrong with owls right owls just like there's nothing wrong with snakes some people would beg to differ right but it's symbolic in the bible the snake the, the serpent the devil that, but there's god doesn't hate the snakes he created he doesn't hate owls he made them but what they symbolize in the Bible is not something very happy or positive, okay? Uh, just tell your neighbor, it's not a pretty picture. <laughs> Psalm chapter 102, verse. let's just run through some scriptures that the Bible mentions owls in, and you'll see what I'm talking about. I am like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. Isaiah 34, 11 talks, this is describing the ruins, okay? Some ancient ruins, and it says, But the hawk and the porcupine shall possess it, and the, the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch the line of confusion over it, and the plumb line of emptiness. Poor owls. Le Leviticus 11, 13 through 19 these are the birds that are detestable. Come on, say detestable. Yeah. This is that word unclean in the Bible, okay? Come on, say detestable. Yeah. Unclean. unclean. Not useful. Yikes. Not useful, okay? To you. You must never eat them. You must never use them for anything, okay? They're not useful. The griffin vulture, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite. Falcons of all kinds. Man, Atlanta is just not doing so well today, right? <laughs> Falcons of all kinds. Ravens of all kinds. The eagle owl, the short-eared owl, the seagull. Hawks of all kinds. The little owl, the corm cormorant, the great owl, the barn owl, the desert owl. The Egyptian vulture, the stork, herons of all kinds, the hoopy, and the bat. You're going to stay up here and worship while we preach the word. Thank you, Allie. Okay, so owls, if you're taking notes, they're inhabitants of ruins and wastelands. Inhabitants of ruins and wastelands. Some of this will be on the screen. Some of it's on your outline. Some of it isn't. So inhabitants, they lived very commonly, biblically speaking, in ruins, the ruins of Palestine, okay? And in the waste places, the wastelands, places that nobody wanted to be. Nobody wanted to live there. 
It was not a pleasant place to be. It was dark and it was lonely and it was solitary. Okay. They were also considered not fit for food. Again, just really not really useful. The owls didn't have much of a purpose. Okay. They were also, and this really got to me as I was really praying about it. They were night feeders. In other words, they have to search for their food in darkness. They are sustained in the darkness. Okay? What else? Most of them are loners and they fend for themselves. They're not really there for anybody else but themselves. Okay? But you guys, we love the owls, don't we? Don't we? That's right. Whoo! All right. We love the owls here at Encounter Church. We love the owls in, in Kennesaw and in Cobb County and all around here, right? Because of our, our beloved KSU owls. And so when we started thinking about doing this block party last year, we had like, you know, probably a dozen possible names we could call the block party. I mean, some of them were fun and crazy and out there. But we, all, we decided... Um, as a leadership team, that we were going to call it Feed the Owls. And not just because we're going to give free hot dogs to everybody and we got free cookies and ice cream and all that great stuff that we're going to have uh, this afternoon. But, but it means something more to us. Feed the Owls, the block party, is a natural picture of we be- what we believe God has called us to do spiritually in this community. To the Kennesaw State Owls and the Owls of the community here in Cobb County, we believe God has called us to feed them. And what do we mean by feed them? Not just naturally, but spiritually. In other words, discipleship. Come on, say, discipleship. We believe God has called us to spiritually feed our community, to teach them the ways of God, the word of God, how to follow Jesus, discipleship. So when we do this event tonight, we're not just saying we love you, here's a hot dog. We're saying we love you, here's a hot dog in representation of the fact that we love you so much that we're here to bring you into the family of God and feed you. Teach you how to follow Jesus and how to love God. As we minister to our community of owls, okay, this is what it means to us. We believe that we've been called to redeem, come on, say redeem, Redeem. the useless, purposeless, you don't have to keep repeating if you don't want to, darkness dwelling, darkness dwelling. It sounds creepy, but it's just reality all around us, right? People live in the dark. Right, Atlanta? People live in the dark, okay? Darkness dwelling, loner, solitary, fend for myself, owls. He's called us to redeem them, right? And help them discover that that's really not who they are. Through the word of God... And discipleship, leading people to encounter Jesus, they will realize that's not who they really are. We might be an owl community, but our identity in Christ is not like the identity of an owl. Okay, what do I mean by that? I I told you it was going to be some odd symbolism today, all right? Let me clear that up a little bit. We want the owls, our KSU community and all around us in Cobb County, we believe Or we desire for them to know the light and love of Jesus. The light and love of Jesus. Those surrounded, hear hear this, those surrounded by darkness. Absolutely, we live surrounded by darkness. There is light and there is freedom in Jesus. Yes, light and freedom in Jesus. Though we do inhabit the world that could very well be described as a scarce, deserted Ruined wasteland, right? There's plenty of good food in the house of God, right? Hello? Owls, are you awake? Did you stay up too late hunting last night? (laughs) Grab some coffee if you need it. All right. There's plenty of good food in the house of God. We're here to tell them you don't have to 
keep living like that in darkness and trying to fend for yourself and, 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 and be sustained in the darkness and find your food in the darkness. No, no. There's plenty of good food. The Word of God, right? The love of Jesus. There's plenty of good food in the house of God. Though the world is a lonely place, there's a place of belonging in the family of God. Though many are out there being loners and, you know, at really, truly just fending for ourselves, right? There is a family full of love called the family of God. And there is a place for them right here in his family. Not only that, but even though it seems like this, the masses are scavenging. They're searching out there in the darkness for meaning, for purpose, And there is so much purpose and fulfillment in a relationship with Jesus. I also believe that these redeemed owls, you guys all right? These redeemed uh, owls are going to use their big redeemed eyes. Come on, open them wide. Eyes, vision. These owls, our community, as it encounters Jesus, are going to use their big redeemed eyes to have big vision from God and their big redeemed ears to have a great understanding of the word of God and their big redeemed strong grip to be strong, radical, committed, devoted disciples of Jesus who will not be moved by the world. Or by darkness. I believe it. That's who we are called to reach. So if you ever wondered why in the world we called it Feed the Owls. That's why. Let's go to our main story today in the Bible. It's in Mark chapter 5. And I, just for the sake of today, have renamed this story Jesus Feeds an Owl. Okay? Jesus Feeds an Owl. I invite you to follow along in your Bible or along on the screen. So they arrived at the other side of the lake, the region of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus climbed out of the boat, an owl, uh, no, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. This man lived among the burial caves. Come on, somebody say, whoo. And so this guy lived in caves around the cemetery. Sound like an owl to you? Sounds like an owl to me. And it says he could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. What, whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, people tried to chain him up and, and, and shackle him down so that, you know, they were trying to change him. They were trying to help him or they were trying to, like, fend for themselves, right? <laughs> they were trying to make sure he didn't hurt them. Um, it says he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills howling and cutting himself with sharp stones when jesus was still some distance away the man saw him ran to meet him and bowed low before him who ran to meet him the demons in this man or this man it was the man It says he ran to Jesus. Because you guys, listen, it doesn't matter how lost or how bound up people are. They know when they see Jesus, there's something that they need. He ran to Jesus. Okay? And it says he he bowed low before him. And then verse 7, with a shriek, he screamed. The demons started taking over. Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? They knew what was about to happen, y'all. Okay? In the name of God, they tried to get even religious on Jesus. Come on, that's just dumb, right? For those of you that didn't know, the devil is religious, okay? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. So the man, you kind of have to read this and think of it in order, right? The man ran to Jesus, bowed low before him, and Jesus rebuked the evil spirit. And then the demons started talking, okay? All right? And, 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 and they started getting all weird on Jesus. And then Jesus demanded, what's your name? As if he didn't know. He just wanted them to say it, right? He wanted us to know. He wanted us to understand. In verse 10, it says, the evil spirits, I'm sorry, 
uh, the rest of the verse says, he replied, my name is Legion because there are many of us inside this man. Some of you are like, well, that's scary. Without Jesus, there were many dwelling inside of me and you too. I'm going to say that again. (laughs) Without Jesus, we lived under the curse of sin. And there were many inside and on us. Well, I don't like that. I don't either. And that's why Jesus came to set you free. And you might need to be set free today. And we can take care of that. There's a couple not happy in here. That's all right. You're fixing to get real happy. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding. um, Verse 10, the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them some distant place. Okay. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them because the devil likes dirty. (laughs) Right? Why do they want to go into the pigs? Pigs were like the most unclean of the unclean. Okay, in that culture, they wanted dirty. The devil likes dirty. If you find yourself in dirtiness and nastiness and filth and perversion, that's the devil. That's what he likes. That's where he likes to live. Okay? Verse 13, and Jesus gave him permission. So the evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the deep hillside and into the lake and drowned in the water because that is exactly what the devil wants to do with you. He wants to kill you. Okay? Verse 14, the herdsmen fled to the nearby town and surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. He didn't get a little bit better. Fully clothed, he ran around naked and dirty and in the caves. Fully clothed and perfectly sane. And it says they were afraid. I'm not sure that that was the right reaction. (laughs) I mean, yes, when God does things, we should be in awe. Oh, my God. But these people, we keep reading, they wanted Jesus to leave. Because some people just don't like change. Okay? We talk about, I want to be free and delivered and woo, no more chains and break the chains. And then when you realize it means there's a big change coming. No, Jesus, you might want to go on to the next town. Okay, what verse are we on? Verse 16, those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he did told them three things that happen in an encounter with Jesus. Three things that happen. This is the gospel of Jesus. This is the power of the gospel of Jesus. This is the power that is released in somebody's life when they encounter Jesus for real. Three things, and then we're going to go through them real quick. The gospel of Jesus changes the unchangeable heals the incurable and redeems the unredeemable the gospel of jesus changes the unchangeable heals the incurable and redeems the unredeemable number one an encounter with jesus christ changes the unchangeable let's look back at verse three and four it says that he couldn't be restrained even with a chain that when he was put into chains and shackles he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. The shackles. Anybody ever lived like that? This is what it looks like. I try really, really hard to change myself. Or, even better, other people try to change me. Or I look to other people to help me change. I'm really hopeless, and I'm really helpless to help myself. But I try anyway. Chains and shackles represent those things that we do ourselves in our flesh and with our religion and with the help of others to try to get better, but we just can't. 
Because sooner or later, no matter how hard that restraint is, no matter how hard somebody tries to help us, boom, it gets broken. And there we are again in a mess. Right? Anybody ever experienced that? The message of the cross can set us free from helplessness and hopelessness. Those things that I have unsuccessfully tried to change and correct by myself can be changed in an instant by the power of the cross. What your effort and religion, (laughs) what your effort can accomplish and what your religion can't reform can be totally transformed by one revelation of the love and the power of Jesus, the cross of Jesus. What you could never do to get, make yourself better, when you see Jesus already paid the full price on the cross to set you free, what was unchangeable gets changed like that. The gospel changes us. Number two, the gospel of Jesus heals the incurable. What am I saying here? Verse 5. Day and night he wandered among the burial graves and in the hills, howling. And what was he doing? Cutting himself. Not other people. Nobody else was hurting him. It says he was wounding. He was abusing himself. He was self. Right. I mean, you know. Get rid of this thing because in five seconds it will self. Destruct. Right. Right. He was self-destructing. Sin has distorted our true identity. Get this today. Sin has distorted our true identity because our true identity is who God made us to be, right? God did not make this man this way. Okay? Well, I was born this way. No, you weren't. Look at me. No, you were not born that way. If you are self-destructing, no, you were not born that way. It's because we were born into this world of sin and we chose to sin and rebel against God that our life is now suffering the consequences of that and our identity, the identity that God created us with that the Bible says is in His image, created in the image of God, that's been distorted And slowly but surely, through sinful habits, we wound ourselves and eventually self-destruct. That's the way way sin works. Say it's the devil. Yes, it's the devil, absolutely. But when we give a place to the devil, we agree with him and we let him in our life and we say yes to what he says, then we just start destroying ourselves. Little by little, we create these sinful habits, and little by little by little, we just destroy ourselves. Okay? Self-destruction. But the gospel sets us free from those sinful habits. Hello? Jesus didn't come just to forgive you. He came to set you free and deliver you. To set you free from those habits that are destroying you. That's the power of the gospel. Jesus didn't come pay the price for sin just to be nice. (laughs) Or even just to say, I'm I'm not going to hold it against you anymore. He went to the cross and he carried sin upon his own back. Upon his own self to the point where God turned his back on him. Yes, to set us free from the consequence of judgment. Yes, but also The Bible says he broke the power of sin from over our lives. We no longer have to live as slaves of sin. We've now become slaves of righteousness unto God. The gospel sets us free from those sinful habits that are slowly but surely destroying us. And how does it happen? It's really powerful what he does. When we encounter the love of Jesus, owls, we begin to realize our true value before God. What we're really worth. And as we see that, our hearts that are broken and our big mess begins to be healed. Now listen to this. When I begin to discover my true identity in Christ, that I am not 
my addiction, that I am not my depression, that I am not sexual immorality, I am not the liar I, I was, I am not, you name it, okay? When I begin to realize that's not me, the real me is in Jesus and in who he says I am, not only do I get set free from bad, destructive habits, but I start learning new ones. These are called spiritual disciplines, okay? We talk about it all the time, reading the word of God, praying, praying in the spirit, worship, fellowship, discipleship. I begin to learn new habits, and these new habits replace those old habits, and instead of self-destructing, I'm propelled into health. I get pushed into Life, real life, abundant life. And what used to be a mess begins to get put together again the way he meant originally. I begin to learn new life-giving habits that renew my perspective and then propel me forward into my destiny. Did you know there's a destiny for you? God has a plan for you. He has a destiny for you. He has a purpose for you. And you were self-destructing. I was self-destructing through my own sinful habits. I was never going to get there. I was never going to fulfill my destiny as long as I was self-destructing. But when I encountered the cross of Jesus, when I encountered the love of Jesus, I began to realize who I really am to him, that that's not me, but that who I see in the Bible, that's me. Who Jesus says I am, that's me. All those promises I see in the word of God, that's me. I begin to renew my perspective. And as I begin to renew my perspective, my habits begin to change. And they went from being bad habits to good habits to better habits to even better habits. And those new habits, and I don't mean, you need to get good habits. Like, you know, I don't mean like self-help kind of stuff. This is the best self-help you can get. Putting, getting the word of God in you and getting discipled and praying in the Holy Spirit and worshiping and being in the presence of the Lord and having a daily devotional. with Those habits do the exact opposite of self-destruct. They make you self-propel. Is everybody all right? You're going to like number three better than number one and two. The gospel, if we really believe it, changes the unchangeable and heals the incurable. Number three, redeems the unredeemable. Verse 15 through 20, talk about what happened to this man. He said the crowd came and they saw what had happened and he used to be possessed and crazy and loco and, and then all of a sudden he, and, and running around naked and all this kind of stuff and cutting himself and howling and acting like an animal. And then they see him, all, all of a sudden, he's there with Jesus sitting down. He's got his clothes on. Thank you, Jesus. He's got his clothes on, and he's totally sane. He's a totally normal, healthy person like that. The gospel of Jesus redeems the unredeemable. What am I saying? He will turn your mess into a testimony. He will turn the mess that you and I have made of our life into a story that will inspire hope in other people. That will let other people know there is hope for me. He redeems the unredeemable. Most people probably thought, I know I would have thought, that this poor soul living in the caves, I would have probably given him up as a lost cause. Like he is off the deep end, never coming back crazy, right? The devil has got a hold on him and he's gone. And Jesus didn't see him that way. There is, no, there is no lost cause to Jesus. Amen. And he, the gospel has the power to take somebody who's made an absolute mess of their life. Come on, somebody say, that's me. And give them a testimony that will impact others. The enemy wanted to destroy you, but God wants to take what the enemy meant to destroy you to turn it into a story. Okay? To help others and give them hope. The enemy is works in darkness but these redeemed owls here at encounter church and all of those we're called to reach we're gonna go into we are going into the darkness and rescuing people out of there how with our story we can tell the story the gospel the cross jesus the resurrection 
He's alive. He's powerful. But not only the, the story, let me tell you my story. I was the dude in the cave cutting myself. I was the guy who had made a mess out of my life. And when I encountered the cross, when I encountered the love of Jesus, Jesus didn't care that I had made a mess. He took my mess and turned it around and turned my mess into a story. So I don't really have a testimony. Yes, you do. Some people have made a much bigger public mess than others. But we've all made a mess of our lives, right? RJ, you can come on back up. God wants to use you to destroy the works of darkness, church. This is the power of the gospel. And this gospel's for you. Why are we doing Feed the Owls? Because we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We really believe it. We really believe here at Encounter Church that when somebody encounters Jesus, everything changes. We really believe that sick bodies and sick hearts get cured, get healed. That chains and addictions and depression really is broken over people's lives. And that God turns our bad history into his story. Right? You can stand up. Do you need Jesus today? I know I do.